here with all the committees when uh, Rock was talking to me about the idea for this hearing. We were talking about how it'd be great to have a virtual field trip for you folks because um, usually we do legislative outreach in the field and this year obviously we're not doing that. Um, so we have tried to prepare a video from a lot of our partners at the University of Hawaii Pacific Co Cooperative Studies Unit and um, DLNR as well that show you how some of the work is continuing under new guidelines um, for COVID. And we've never done this um, over Zoom before, so bear with me while I try to share a video uh, through the Zoom system. Okay, I think everybody is hopefully seeing a um, black screen at this point. All right. And we're going to see if the uh, audio works for this as well. We just lost the audio. All right, so hopefully you saw some of that. I've been getting um, texts in the background that the audio and video were both a little bit stuttery, but uh, you know, we're doing what we can over um, Zoom these days. And I'm gonna put the um, link to the video uh, where we have it hosted on um, Vimeo. I'm gonna send it to Rock here so that he can share it um, with all of you, or I guess to um, Cure. That was good, Josh. Not quite as good as a site visit, but close. We hope to have those back uh, next year. But, uh, you know, in the meantime, you know, let me know if you want a custom made video, because uh, that's all we can offer. Um, but hopefully that gives you a sense that even though it's been a very difficult year, the groups that work on invasive species in Hawaii are just incredibly dedicated and um, the work hasn't stopped in any way. Um, as soon as we got the word that it was considered essential. Um, it's something that everyone's been really committed to continuing to make happen because uh, we don't want to lose progress on that. Um, and so we'll get that um, original video link out to everyone and then we'll be posting it on social media as well. Um, and now I think we're going to transition a little bit into doing some more of the DLNR DOFA presentations. 
uh, unless there are any initial questions. And then um, I'm gonna invite um, Chelsea Arnott, uh, if it's okay with the chairs, to join me for just some introductory slides that um, are from kind of the Interagency Invasive Species Council perspective. Um, and the HISC, of course, is administered at uh, DLNR Division of Forestry and Wildlife. So Chelsea is here. Chelsea, do you want to um, just give your uh, name and title for everybody? Yeah, aloha chairs, vice chairs, and committee members. I'm Chelsea Arnott, planner with Hawaiian Basin Species Council under the Department of Land and Natural Resources, uh, Division of Forestry and Wildlife. So thanks so much for organizing this, and, and thanks, Josh, for the introduction. So I'm going to be sharing everybody's slides today, um, but we're gonna let everybody do their own talking. So um, Chelsea and I will co-present this first piece here. Uh, as soon as I find the right app. Okay, Chelsea, the first slide is yours. Yeah, great. And and then this just continues with what Josh was saying in the video, the work continues and, and that continues with the Hawaii Interagency Biosecurity Plan um, that was released in 2017. And so the work for this plan and implementing the 147 actions still continues through the pandemic. We're now going on year four of implementation and we're 65% of the way through in implementing those tasks. So you can see that on the pie chart um, at the top there. And so this is our shared path forward for the state in identifying those gaps and how to address the most pressing invasive species issues. Um, I'll just real quickly highlight a few things that have happened over the past year that were addressed in the biosecurity plan. Um, there was a restriction on all species of plants in the myrtle family into Hawaii put in um, through Hawaii Department of Agriculture. So this is a state restriction and that protects ohia from additional pests and diseases that can be introduced on um, different myrtle species, especially our ohia plants. And also HDOA is hosting post-incident meetings for rapid response to LFA, especially, so that's little fire ant, especially here on Oahu. And then just a couple of things that are still in progress. Um, discussions on a biocontrol facility with federal and state partners, looking at a new state-of-the-art facility for that. But jumping into things that are needed, we're still looking for funds um, for a Pacific Regional Biocontrol Center and looking at capacity to co-manage vessel biofouling and ballast water discharge. We're still working on finalizing our progress report for this past six months. Um, so when we have that published, we'll put it up on our HIST page and anybody that's interested in that full report, we can send it to you. Thanks, Chelsea. And um, I always try to uh, just let the legislature know when we share those slides that um, we don't want to oversell it when we say that 30-something um, percent are completed or ongoing. Most of those are ongoing tasks. Um, and so, you know, it, it takes a lot of time and consideration to move um, biosecurity plan actions from uh, a, a stage where they're in progress to where they're really completed. Um, so a lot of those are just ongoing perpetual things that we're working on and we need continued support for. So thank you. Um, the next couple of slides we wanted to talk about, these uh, might look familiar to you from previous years, so I'm going to be really brief with them. But especially in this year where we have um, an economic downturn, it bears repeating that biosecurity saves money. Um, investing in invasives is a very good investment because um, what the state spends on positions or operations for invasive species prevention, control, or outreach it saves enormous amounts of money in potential impacts to the state from invasive species. So this um, figure here goes into a lot of the presentations we do, and it gives just some examples from a couple of species, uh, some of which are here in Hawaii already, like Myconia, the second bar there. That's the estimated amount of damages uh, each year by um, an estimate from UHERO at UH for groundwater uh, recharge and lost bird habitat, 
or the fourth bar there, Little Fire Ants, Hawaii County only, that's from a 2013-2015 estimate of what the annual damages are under a, a reduced management scenario. So basically the, the little amount of money that we put in now, if that were to go away, that's what the annual impacts to several different sectors would be just for Hawaii County. And then there are two species up here that uh, we don't yet have in Hawaii. One is red imported fire ant and the other is brown tree snake. And you can see what the estimated damages are. And those are annual figures. Um, the brown tree snake one is for, I believe, lost tourism as well as um, medical incidents and damage to electrical infrastructure if snakes were to be, uh, brown tree snakes were uh, to be established in Hawaii. So those are just a handful of species and you weigh those costs against um, what the biosecurity plan suggests for programmatic uh, operating or personnel costs. And based on what the state was spending in fiscal year 14, I believe was uh, the year that the Legislative Reference Bureau did their analysis, the um, additional amount beyond that, that the biosecurity plan um, says that we could be spending to do a really good job at prevention, control, et cetera, is about 30 million a year, um, which, you know, we're talking about a, a biosecurity plan that looks at building capacity over time. And that's a difficult thing to talk about when the state budget is um, in peril. But um, we would just reiterate that when you invest a dollar in invasive species work, uh, we get more than a dollar back uh, and then some. So just another way to make this visual, this is a, a Photoshop mock-up from the coconut rhinoceros beetle response team at HDOA. We talk a lot about what the economic impacts are in dollar amount, but you think about the impact to kind of the feel of Hawaii if something like coconut rhinoceros beetle spread. This is Waikiki as it looks now, um, pre-COVID of course, with people milling around outside. And then this is what it could look like um, if coconut rhinoceros beetle was really widespread. And this is, you know, um, it's a little dramatic, but it's also realistic. Uh, there are places in Guam that look somewhat like this because they have um, really extensive coconut rhinoceros beetle infestation. And um, so one of the things that we wanted to talk about today before we get into more specific presentations is kind of looking back at what happened in the last economic downturn. So we've been in this situation before where the state economy is um, looking at some potential cuts uh, rather than growth. And um, that's actually part of the reason the biosecurity plan exists. It was a plan about bringing back capacity after there was a reduction in force following the 2008 downturn. And it took, um, sometimes um, in some of those cases, some of those programs still have not been built up to where they were before that reduction in force. So when the biosecurity plan was released in 2017, those are the figures you can see uh, on the right side of the screen. The uh, plant industry division was still down, I think in plant quarantine at HDOA, they might be back to where they were in terms of inspector positions in 2008. Um, but you know, the amount of cargo and the amount of passengers coming through Hawaii uh, has increased since then. And so we're hopefully looking at an era where we are increasing these position counts rather than uh, decreasing them. And similarly, the biosecurity plan looks at the invasive species response for uh, vectors of human health. So a department of health uh, in that reduction in force, we lost the entire vector control branch at DOH or nearly the entire thing. And it took a, a massive outbreak of dengue fever on Hawaii Island, I think is probably the, the event that got that branch to come back online. Um, while we can't say that the reduction of force caused any of the infestations that you see listed here in bullet point, um, it's very arguable that had we not lost some of those positions, maybe there would have been you know, additional resources to deal with some of these things before we had really expensive response and control programs. And so um, during that reduction in force, that's when we see coconut rhinoceros beetle on Oahu, little fire ant on Oahu, and on um, now most of the main islands, uh, a few other really notable insect invasions. It's a time of spreading for rapid death and then the um, dengue fever 
uh, response as well. And my final slide here is just to point out that in the executive budget, we're looking at um, 17 positions potentially being removed just within the DLNR Division of Forestry and Wildlife. Um, because this is the invasive species uh, info briefing, I wanna highlight that uh, one of the positions that could potentially be lost is my old position, the invasive species coordinator at DLNR DOFA that manages the Hawaii Invasive Species Council. I vacated that to move to a different position just before the hiring freeze. And so that position, uh, we're looking to do a trade off with operating funds so that the position isn't lost. And the same is true for the supervisor for that position, the wildlife management program specialist. They oversee the wildlife program statewide at DLNR DOFA. And um, that position is, is not eliminated at this point, but it's unfunded. And so we want to try to do operating fund trade-offs to make sure that that uh, position isn't lost. It takes a lot of time to restore a position after it's been cut. So we're hoping that by either um, keeping positions unfunded or by doing operating funds um, as a trade-off, we can potentially maintain that capacity or at least keep the positions unfunded on the books until such a time that we can fund them again. Um, and then there's also a secretary position on Maui uh, that is in the same situation. We're looking for operating fund trade-offs in the executive budget. Uh, that's it for me. Um, I'll defer to the chairs, whether you wanna do questions now or we'll transition into the, the next part of the deal in our um, talks and hold questions for the end. Let's, uh, Josh, let's save the questions for the end, okay? Sure. Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Rob Hoff and Emma Ewan and their slides are up now. Thanks, Josh. Uh, so I'm Rob Hoff, I'm the State Protection Forester for Division of Forestry and Wildlife. I work on forest pest issues for the division and uh, one of the, the major projects that uh, we've been working on have been, has been rapid ohia death and the response to that uh, disease. Uh, we've been very fortunate in previous years to receive specific appropriations from the legislature for rapid ohia death, totaling nearly $4 million. Last year, because of COVID, we were uh, unable to receive that appropriation. So we had to turn to other sources to keep priorities going uh, related to rapid ohia death. And we, we did uh, apply for HISC funds and had multiple proposals funded for between 300 dollars and $400,000, but also relied on federal and private funds. And some of those priority uh, activities that we uh, really needed to continue were surveying and responding to new outbreaks in areas where there haven't been detections before, keeping the diagnostics lab going so that we can continue to process samples, uh, continuing research so we know how the disease is actually getting around the islands and informing the public. Next slide. So I'm going to quickly go through uh, just what the status is on the different islands for folks. Um, the uh, Hawaii Island is where we originally detected it and where it's most widespread. This map is a little bit skewed toward um, toward access. This is where we've actually been in on the ground and uh, collected samples. But as you can see, it's fairly wide widespread through the island. There's some areas uh, in Pubava Forest Reserve and uh, PTA where they still have not detected it, but it's pretty widespread. Uh, next slide. Here on Oahu, we have only had five detections of Stratasysis julio here, which is the less aggressive form. Um, they've really ramped up sampling, um, still no Luku here. And I was going to mention that uh, those two detections on Windward side uh, were residential plantings, people who had backyard ohia trees who uh, reported the trees dying and we were able to follow up with sampling. Next slide. On Kauai, there's been uh, many more detections of both uh, Julio Hia and Luku Hia, the aggressive form. Uh, most concerning is that red dot on the west side of the island. That's a detection of Luku Hia that was just made last month in high quality native forest. And we're currently coming up with a plan to contain that detection 
uh, as best as possible before it spreads into the high value native forest there. Um, I also wanted to mention, since I didn't do a map of Maui Nui, we've actually only had one detection on Maui Island. Um, it was an agriculture area and a planted tree and it was destroyed. This was back in July 2019 and we've had no further detections on any of the islands on Maui Nui. Next slide. Our public outreach uh, team remained very active um, despite COVID-19 conditions. They went virtual with a lot of the workshops and webinars to keep folks informed. They came up with new travel alert posters to go up in the airports as we gear up to have more travel in the state. And they also um, helped deploy uh, signage and food cleaning stations at the at trailheads with uh, especially more locals going out and hiking uh, this past year. We wanted to make sure people had what they need to make sure they're not spreading the disease. Next slide, Josh. But as you can see from that, that slide on Hawaii Island, it is widespread and Rapidohia death is something that we're going to be living with um, for the foreseeable future. And we really need to come up with long term management strategies for Rapidohia death. Genetic resistance is one thing we're looking into, but that's very long term. Um, another thing that uh, we're looking at, and Emma Ewan is going to present on this in more detail, but we're finding an interaction between feral animals and uh, incidents of Rapidohia death uh, on Hawaii Island. Um, we also need more tools for invasive plant control. Um, in many of these areas on Hawaii Island where the canopy has been uh, completely decimated, uh, it's invasive plants that are coming in to replace that ohia forest. Uh, we also need improved biosecurity capacity to prevent the next Rapidohia death from coming in. Next slide, Josh. So one of the one of our um, best tools for managing invasive plants like strawberry guava, clydemia, and ginger are is biological control. Um, it's safe for the environment, um, and uh, once it's released, there's very little you have to do. We're, we've been working closely with DLNR, or excuse me, HDOA, the Forest Service, and UH to uh, increase our capacity for bi biological control. We've formed a biological control working group with these various agencies. And we're really focusing on the need for new facilities. And that's, that's a pretty steep ask, especially in these economic times. Um, but in order to really um, meet the demand we have for biological control, we are gonna need new state-of-the-art facilities. And we've been working with our congressional delegation to see if we might get some federal support for this, for this initiative. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Emma Ewan, to present the second half. Aloha. I'm um, the Native Ecosystem Program Manager with DLNR Division of Forestry and Wildlife. And here you can see on the left an aerial image showing what our raw team are surveying, the um, dead and dying trees in the canopy. And this um, surveys have really uncovered a very powerful um, new tool that can pr um, protect these large landscapes across many um, acres. And that's fencing and removing hooved animals such as cattle, pigs, goats, and sheep, which create wounds in the trees by peeling off bark or pigs dig at the roots of ohia. And then that creates the, the wound that is needed for the fungus to enter. Without a wound, these trees can withstand um, uh, the fungus kind of pulling around in, in the, the air. And so that's the, the big ticket um, or the big uh, vector. Next slide. So this is really clearly shown in this uh, image that was just actually um, gotten last month. And Dr. Ryan Peroy's lab with UH Hilo did an aerial survey of the 6,000 acre unit in Kahuku, where you can see on the left, there's fenced areas. And on the right, there's this long skinny piece of unfenced area and the red and orange dots are the potential rapid ohia death on um, brown and dying trees. And so the difference is really night and day. And this effect, as well as on the ground plot data, has been showing that fence that have these um, hooved animals removed in them are have much lower rates of disease than adjacent forests that are unfenced. And so the ability to, of ohia to regrow in these situations is also really affected by hooked animals. There was a USGS study with Hawaii Cooperative Studies Unit at UH Hilo that recently came out showing that 
ohia that had hooved animals removed and were fenced were three times more likely to survive than ones that were unfenced. And in fact, hooved animal presence was actually a much bigger cause of mortality than rapid ohia death for these seedlings. So we've really long known how hooved animals are really damaging for the forest in general, you know, trampling, eating plants, spreading weeds, and that sort of thing. But now the urgency to protect these forests is all that much greater. Next slide. The um, DLNR in this upcoming um, biennium is requesting $4 million per year for um, to fencing to protect 20,000 acres that you can see in yellow on this map. And the areas that we've completed and have protected since the watershed initiative began about a decade ago are shown in, in green. And then the ones that are currently funded and underway are in um, blue. And so we're halfway towards the goal to protect 30% of our watershed forests by 2030. And this additional CIP funding is really critical to have us stay on track to reach that goal. Next slide. So um, since we started, we have built 141 miles of fence in some of the most remote and difficult terrain imaginable. And um, we're currently constructing around 86 miles. And that $4 million a year ask for fiscal year 22 and 23 is a little reduced compared to the last couple of years due to budget constraints, but it will allow us to stay on track. And um, next slide. Wanted to also mention the CIP that we're requesting is absolutely essential for us to provide match for um, grants. In the past decade, the operating and CIP funds that we have put to Watershed Initiative has allowed us to raise $39 million in non-state grants. And that funding largely goes to um, directly to jobs for fence builders. In most islands, there are multiple construction crews like this one in East Maui that rely on watershed CIP funding. So we're really hoping that this additional $4 million a year in CIP money will um, be able to support both attracting more funding from um, federal grants as well as these, these crews that um, create local jobs. Next slide. So these forests are also really um, home, uh, relied on by our native birds that are in this extinction crisis. And I just wanted to remind folks that we're doing a birds not mosquitoes steering committee of, um, that is an interagency effort to give mosquitoes a Wolbachia bacteria that makes them unable to breed successfully. And this is called an incompatible insect technique. And so our steering committee is doing the technological and regulatory steps to allow those mosquitoes to be released. And we're getting federal funding to do surveys for re research on where these mosquitoes exist and um, moving this project along. Next slide. So I just wanted to end on a hopeful note and show how fencing can really bring the forest back. This is in um, East Molokai. And you know before this area was fenced, and hooked animals removed here in um, 2009. Uh, next slide. So you can see that a lot of those grazed areas um, now in 2015 are slowly starting to come back. You can see little ohia seedlings just naturally coming up. These weren't planted, um, but without a f um, the hooked animals, these forests really can regrow. And next slide. Now that same area in 2020. And so these newly fenced areas are absorbing carbon. They're actually really key to allow the state to meet our carbon neutrality goals. Um, and they're replenishing our water, they're stopping erosion. And we really hope that these fences and these life-giving forests can continue um, with that watershed CIP request in the upcoming biennium. Thanks. Okay, Josh, is that it? Did you have uh, DAR, Brian Nielsen? Uh... Yes, uh, there should be someone from uh, the Division of Aquatic Resources who's gonna um, quickly go through the slides for the rest of DLNR and then we'll switch agencies. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Yeah, our biologist, Natalie Dunn, will be providing the presentation. 
Thanks, Brian. This is Natalie Dunn. I'm a, an aquatic biologist with the Aquatic Invasive Species Team at DAR. Next slide, please, Josh. So Hawaii's aquatic resources drive the tourism industry, generating about $1.2 billion a year. Additionally, Hawaii's nearshore coral reef fisheries are estimated to be worth about $13.3 million annually. Coral reefs also protect coastal environments from erosion and flooding and are estimated to protect about $835 million worth in building value each year. As a result of the island's uh, geographic isolation, Hawaii has a high percentage of endemic species and unique ecosystems that are highly susceptible to invasive species. Next slide, please. So an aquatic invasive species is a non-native species that if introduced to an ecosystem may cause harm to Hawaii's economy, environment, human health, or public safety and welfare. There are estimated to be about 463 marine and 86 freshwater introduced aquatic species in Hawaii. Next slide, please. These are some examples of vectors of species introductions with ballast water and biofouling being the top two. So ballast water is water that vessels uptake and discharge to maintain their stability and biofouling refers to organisms that are attached to vessel hulls. Next slide, please. So the Aquatic Invasive Species Program works to control, manage, and prevent introduced species in marine and inland waters of Hawaii that are causing or could cause environmental, economic, or human health impacts. The team effectively transitioned to teleworking relatively quickly in the wake of the COVID pandemic some projects were delayed for a couple months, but we adapted protocols and were able to resume and keep projects on track. So just a couple highlights from 2020. Um, next slide, please, Josh. In Kaneohe Bay, smothering seaweed smothers corals and is one of the areas with the highest percent coral cover on Oahu. The invasive algae control began with mechanical removal followed by outplanting native sea urchins to graze down the algae. This year highlights the 10 year anniversary of the sea urchin hatchery, which has produced uh, 600,000 urchins since the first, out, first outplant in 2011. This operation is the most successful marine biocontrol effort in Hawaii. The operation has been so successful that we expanded our efforts to control invasive al algae in the Waikiki MLCD. The primary targets in this area are gorilla ogo and prickly seaweed. Next slide, please. Another highlight from 2020, uh, there was a dry dock that had accumulated over 30 years of biofouling that was going to be brought to Hawaii from the mainland. We coordinated with the shipping company and advised them to clean the hull prior to their departure. They voluntarily cleaned the hull on the mainland and consented to a voluntary hull survey upon their arrival to Hawaii. The AIS, te AIS team conducted an interagency hull inspection with NOAA and found that the majority of the survey area did appear to have been cleaned. However, there were a few pockets where live organisms were found, one of which is a known invasive species in Australia. The um, sea star you see at the bottom of right of the screen is Asterius amarensis. So all live organisms were removed and sent to the Bishop Museum for taxonomic and genetic analysis. Next slide, please. We also responded to a report of suspected non-native corals observed by the Cavella Ohana, who has uh, gen generational knowledge in the bay. We assessed the area and management options and in July removed the invasive corals. This effort was collaborative and many partners, including Heia NERS, Waikiki Aquarium, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA, HIMB, and the community were consulted and some took part in the removal. Fortunately, the footprint was fairly manageable and we removed the majority of the invasive corals in two days. So these efforts highlight the critical function of the AIS team's rapid response, kind of um, similar to what Josh was talking about at the beginning, um, quickly responding to a report before, species, uh, before a species spreads and proliferates, reduces ecological harm, as well as long-term costly management efforts. Next slide, please. Another important highlight from 2020 is the Vessel Incidental Discharge Act. So I'm gonna go over just a few main points here and what those mean for our team. The VITA will preempt states from regulating more stringent ballast water and biofouling rules, which are the top two sources of AIS introductions. Along with that, VITA will allow in-water cleaning of vessel hulls in state water starting December 2022, which is currently restricted in Hawaii. VITA will allow states to enforce or co-enforce new U.S. Coast Guard regulations that will come into effect in December 2022. Last, VITA will prohibit states from charging shipping companies a fee to support this regulatory work. 
which means this will not be a source of revenue for Hawaii. Furthermore, this will be inconsistent across states. So for example, here in Hawaii, our program is one staff and one intern, whereas California has uh, multiple teams and they charge a fee to support their work. Next slide, please. So to get some of Hawaii's invasive species concerns heard and addressed in collaboration with CGAPS, DLNR participated in meetings before regulations were proposed and collaborated with West Coast states and other agencies. We submitted comments, participated in a multi-state letter and supported governor's objection and assisted with the CZM consistency review. Moving forward, there are legal questions about several aspects of VITA and the new rules that will need to first be clarified or resolved we will also need to assess and amend state regulations to enforce and co-enforce with the U.S. Coast Guard. We are suggesting a 2021 resolution calling on all relevant agencies and, interest, and interested parties to work together to assess and come up with proposed legislation prior to the 2022 session. Last, as mentioned, moving forward, the restrictions on fees will pose a challenge with revenue to support vessel inspections and enforcement. Next slide, please. In addition to the revenue challenges with VITA, like many other programs, we're also dealing with the economic downturn associated with the COVID pandemic. We have three unfunded positions and the civil service AIS team is currently running at about 57% capacity. However, our team has successfully transitioned to teleworking as well as adapted field protocols that allow for safe operations. Next slide, please. Looking to 2021, moving forward with VITA, we, pl we plan to draft the resolution to work together to propose legislation and continue uh, to engage in the rulemaking process. And we also plan to continue our work with AIS prevention, early detection, rapid response, monitoring, and control. Next slide, please. For our legislative needs, I mentioned the resolution. Uh, we also ask for his continued support, which helps fund this program as well as your continued support for the Division of Aquatic Resources. And last slide. For any questions, you can contact me or uh, Brian Nielsen, the Div Division Administrator. And for further information, you can visit our website here. Thank you, Mahalo. Okay, so is that it, DLNR? That's it for DLNR, yes. Thank you very much, uh, folks. Hmm. I will turn it over to Department of Ag. Aloha Chair, this is uh, Phyllis Shimabuko Geyser. Um, while uh, we're waiting for our slides to get set up, here we go. I'd like to introduce Darcy Oishi, uh, Acting Plant uh, Pest Control Branch Manager, who will do the presentation. Hi, my name is Darcy Oishi. Uh, thank you, Senator Gabbard, Chairs, Vice Chairs, and uh, members for this opportunity of uh, talking about the impacts from coronavirus that the plant industry has had to adjust for in the COVID era. Next slide, please. Um, I'll be talking about impacts on surveys, trainings, diagnostics, and responses that, um, and highlight it with some actual real world, world adjustments that we've made. Next slide, Josh. Uh, for surveys, we have still managed to conduct them, but um, they've been slowed. We uh, are limiting people and we have rules on how we deploy people in vehicles. So, and all staff have to wear PPE. Um, we've had limited staff to handle our surveys and responses. We had uh, two federal positions that uh, we were trying to fill, but um, were unable to get filled before uh, the shutdowns occurred and uh, as such we have no dedicated survey team anymore and uh, at times it's been difficult to assist the neighbor islands. Uh, here is uh, pictures of our orchid fleck virus response. Orchid fleck virus is one of the most damaging uh, citrus pests in the world and uh, it was found impacting trees in uh, Waikia on the big island and uh, we had to normally we would deploy um, staff from Oahu, but this occurred in that critical March, April time period when uh, travel was suspended. Uh, so our, our local staff worked with University of Hawaii. Thank you, Dean Comer, for, uh, for uh, to eradicate the infestation on, on premises. 
Next slide. Um, we've had to uh, adapt our training. Normally when we have a new pest incursion, uh, we deploy our most uh, relevant staff to whatever island, um, train people whoever we need to and, and get things going. Uh, since COVID, uh, we have switched to virtual training. So we develop uh, keys and, and guides to facilitate the training of our staff. Uh, one, of the, um, one of the side benefits is we've been able to provide much more support, uh, not just for our staff, but for our partners in getting the message out, what to look for, think, how to look for things. And, um, and so there's been some positives that are takeaways, but what we do have is a lag sometimes in responsiveness. Um, uh, we're having to dedicate time from my specialists to develop these training aids uh, to, to support um, the statewide needs for training. And, and this is an example of our coffee leaf rust um, guide for, uh, uh, and how, how to determine coffee leaf rust over coffee leaf spot. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we've had some delays in diagnostics. Uh, this normally is how, how we used to operate. We would have field crews from Oahu going out to neighbor islands uh, to assist on island staff. And then as they would be coming back, they'd be bring, bringing back the key diagnostic samples. Uh, we've, <clears throat> uh, we've partnered with plant quarantine and some and other partner agencies in order to facilitate getting samples. Uh, um, some of our diagnostics is actually done with uh, support from University of Hawaii, USDA ARS, and a variety of other agencies in order to help streamline our process. Uh, but uh, we do see some delays in getting samples routed. And parts of that is not just uh, a capacity issue with staff, but uh, impacts for transportation um, and, and our ready ability to move material quickly uh, because of um, broken supply chains and movement chains. Next slide. Uh, we've had uh, limited response capabilities also. Uh, after COVID-19, uh, we did limit uh, services to the public because of our offices are being closed to the public. So we don't receive samples being walked in. Um, again, as when we lost our uh, federally funded uh, staffing capabilities uh, for pest, in, pest detection and response. Uh, we basically had all of, all of the phone calls is coming to one individual who then uh, see, makes sure that calls go to the right people. And we, with people working from home, we get a lot of calls over issues like avocado lace bug. Um, and and uh, there's a lot of email and phone traffic uh, and we've been responding in kind by email and, and phones, but uh, because of our limited capacity, this has been impacted. Uh, and our, our final slide. Uh, so COVID highlighted some of our needs, which is we need more specialists and, and survey units, especially in order to uh, improve our responses and our ability to address the needs of the public and industry. Um, over the past few years, we've been seeing uh, our staff get lim more limited, especially on the, on the other islands. Um, and that's become problematic here on uh, for, for some of our islands. And, but we, we made some positive adjustments and, uh, and one of the big positives has been reinforcing our internal and external working relationships. So uh, a, a perfect example is uh, we, we enhanced our relationship with Kulama Lanai in order to ensure we could get surveys done. They actually sent us samples after getting a quick crash course on how to package COVID, um, corona, uh, rust infested samples, how to actually recognize it. Uh, they've done an excellent job and, and they're, um, after that quick training, maybe they can uh, join the Department of Ag as employees down the line. Um, Sorry, I, I 
wanted to speed things up so we could get back on track. So that's all from us. Thank you very much. And next we have uh, Dean Nick Comerford from CTAR. Dean. Thank you, Senator. And uh, hello to you, Senator. Hello to the committee chairs and all the committee members. I'd just like to talk from this one slide to give you an idea of where we stand in CTAR, um, the difficulty we've had because of COVID, but also how we're trying to compensate and try to keep the, the work going forward. So I've got two columns here. One is um, the, our positions that were related to biosecurity that were, were swept in the last session. Um, and then the other one is uh, since we have, since March, any kind of position that resulted in a retirement, a resignation, or a new hire has been frozen and continues to be frozen. So uh, on the left column, uh, we were in the process of hiring an IPM specialist for Hawaii County. Uh, why we had one there years ago and it was never refilled. This was an opportunity for us to enhance our biosecurity operation on that island. Uh, a mycologist retired and we were in the process of rehiring that mycologist. In both those positions, we have faculty on campus who have training in mycology in their background and have tried to pick up some of the additional work that comes along uh, with those specific areas. We did have 11 agricultural technicians statewide at our research and extension centers that were swept. It's not as bad as it might look. About half of those positions had been open positions for years and swept, sweep, sweeping them really didn't make a difference because we never had the funding to fill those positions. However, about another half of them were positions that through retirements and at least one resignation, we were in the process of refilling those at the time. Uh, how that relates to biosecurity is that with our ag technicians, these are the folks that are often um, in the field doing a lot of the work, taking a lot of the samples, helping the faculty with their research and supporting the extension programs. We also lost uh, on Oahu our pesticide education position. This is related to our IR4 program. Uh, for those of you not familiar with IR4, this is federal funding that we can get where it is uh, testing the efficacy of different uh, pesticides, as well as defining the data that's needed to put a different pesticide on the label for a particular crop. Um, our IR4 program though does continue with one of the faculty in one of our departments. And right now, given the uh, coffee leaf rust problem, their focus is on testing different pesticides in conjunction with trying to control uh, leaf rust. On the other column, these are our frozen positions. I, like I said, that they're either retirements, a lot of retirements. The college was a little bit long in the tooth and uh, most of these were planned retirements, although some I think were retirements that came about because it was becoming difficult to get the work done and, and they were at retirement age. Also new positions, positions that had re been retired in the past and were redefined trying to enhance our biosecurity approach in the state. Uh, the first is the urban landscape management position. Um, obviously, this has a, a lot to do with um, integrated pest management, both uh, in urban areas and in nurseries. Another one was control environment agriculture. Uh, although I think this position was, was, re was returned. I believe last year it was removed, but then through the grace of uh, of the legislature, I believe it was returned. This is an incredibly important position for the future, we believe.
So in each case, that then uh, went to an evaluation of the potential problem and, if necessary, some level of control. Uh, that position uh, is just a hard one for us to, to take. So what we've done is we've tried to scrape some money together in the college. We've got somebody on a part-time basis for a short time who's at least trying to keep up the samples that come in so we can maintain some semblance of activity and help for the farmers on the, on the big island. We were in the process of uh, hiring an aquaculture specialist. Uh, one of the aspects of this job was also to look at biosecurity and diseases and that uh, in aquaculture environments. This was a, uh, a shared position with uh, the C grant program. And we were each going to uh, take it halfway. And that was a, one of the one things that we've been trying to do is share positions outside the college to get more use, more, well, more efficiency with the funding that we do have. And the last position that is currently frozen is turf grass management specialist due to retirement last month. And this position, like the urban landscape management position, does have a role in the use of pesticides, the recommendation of pesticides. It was a specialist position, so it is extension, and was really helpful in uh, looking, helping our clientele decide what the problem was and then integrate pest management approach to, uh, to address it. So, Senator, that's, that's the short form. Uh, we're doing the best we can to uh, keep things going by the faculty stepping up. And I can tell you, I'm incredibly proud with all the people throughout the college and how they've reacted to the pandemic and the response that they've given, 100%, 120%. Thank you, Dean. Okay, we are, I think if you can stick around folks for, uh, I'm having some internet problems, but uh, if you can still hear me, we'll have some Q and A for uh, maybe 15 minutes. I'll start it off. Can, can everybody hear me? Cause I've lost. Uh, we can hear you, Mike. We can, good, okay. So I have a question. I'll start off the questions with uh, for either of the, uh, the three agencies, and that is that we're almost halfway through the, the timeline for the 2017-2027 biosecurity plan. And I just wanted to get uh, you know, an idea of what your priorities are going forward, maybe from DLNR, from Department of Ag. And, Respond. Uh, if nobody else from DLNR wants to take that, I'm happy to. Uh, with Good, Josh. Thank you. Approval. Um, I would say that our um, priority is moving forward, recognizing that the economy is uh, going to be a major talking point for the next few years, is maintaining what capacity we have in operating funds and positions. Um, and then our departmental work under the biosecurity plan a lot of it was around capacity building. And so adding new like invasive species technician positions at Division of Forestry and Wildlife, um, converting the um, ballast water and biofouling program at Division of Aquatic Resources to civil service and adding positions there. I hope that's still possible uh, with the years remaining in the biosecurity plan. There are a number of small um, policy changes that could be made without necessarily requiring funds. And so we can look at those um, as ways to make progress through either statutes or administrative rules. But I, I think um, my experience working with all the agencies on the biosecurity plan is that um, the work really comes down to um, people and the resources. And so I think that's probably our priority moving forward. Okay. I also want to mention that the, um, we recently had some stimulus funding that came in from the CARES Act that provided a lot of opportunities for short-term hires. And in the past, environment has been a really key way to get people back um, employed. So that's another big opportunity that potential future um, stimulus funding could provide in addition to you know, the Watership CIP and other um, existing jobs that we have provided. Anyone else want to weigh in on the biosecurity plan? Yes, uh, Senator Gavitt, Bob Masuda. 
Hey, Bob. Just, just to share with you that from a management perspective, we're looking at how we can cover and, and not eliminate functions. And so, for example, uh, both strawberry guava and ohia uh, rod have two teams working on stuff. So what we're exploring, Rob and, and Bill Starman and others are exploring to see how we can uh, combine the work of, uh, since a lot of this are in our native Hawaiian forest, how we can combine work uh, around both of these areas. And, and just to leave some of our newer uh, legislators with a thought, when you look at those bald head coconut trees that uh, Josh showed you, uh, it's dramatic. But another thing that's dramatic that people don't think about is our basic basic most important priority is saving the quality of our water and our watersheds that Hawaii has. And this is directly related to our forest protection, our fencing to protect our watersheds. But think about strawberry guava, just strawberry guava, not the rapid or here that. Strawberry guava during normal times evapotranspirates 27% more water than a native wine forest. 27%. But in times of drought, the studies by Tom Jambaluka and other hydrologists have shown that strawberry guava evapotranspirates up to 54% more water during times of drought than a native wine forest. When you think about that, it's, it's very dramatic in terms of what we have. And two of our most precious, precious blessings in Hawaii and I'll leave you with this thought, is the quality of our air and the quality of our water, two basic blessings that we have. And so, you know, we're, we're taking a look at how we can uh, deal with stuff and, and it's a challenge and we're not coming to cry, but to share information and work together with you in a consultative way. So there are uh, areas that are totally new, like, uh, inviting others and visitors to share in the cost of protecting and restoring with different fees. There, are, uh, so we're coming up with some proposals, and and we'll be uh, looking forward to sharing with each of your committees uh, in in a time when we have more more opportunity for discussion. Just wanted to share those thoughts with you, and and thank you all because we look forward to. Uh, this session being one in which consultation is very actively uh, conducted. Thank you. Chair Gabbard, I have a question. Okay, go ahead, uh, Bennett. Yeah, so I noticed that particularly for Rapid Ohia, um, community outreach was an integral part of uh, your plan. Mm -hmm. Now, COVID, it's difficult, obviously. So have you pivoted to... Um, any kind of outreach or have you completely stopped? No, we're one of the nice things about working with uh, in, in DLNR is, you know, we have a lot of experienced old timers, but we have a lot of very bright, very inspired young people. And so they're a lot more up on technology. And so working together, I think we've made a shift to use of technology, as you've seen Josh, uh, as an example, do, do a, a virtual field trip. Well, we look forward to taking some of you who haven't been on our field trip in the field, uh, on field trips when we can do that. Uh, in the meanwhile, we've done a lot of outreach uh, virtually. Right now, Josh and Emma and a, uh, I have a team of bright young people working out of different uh, silos like aquatic resources, forestry, wildlife, etc. And we're, we're coming up with some good brainstorms to develop uh, presentations, uh, telework kind of, tele-education, and working with some of our friends at the Department of Education, where they're doing more telework, for example, tele-study. We're trying to create field trips and science education programs for students. So we're making the shift very comfortably and, and our work together with Department of Ag and, 
and Nick and uh, CTAR folks are all very collaborative. So I, th I think that's been very helpful. Thank but thanks for asking. Technology is, is something that is helping us in this challenging time. Thank you, Bob. Anyone else? Questions? I have a, I have a few questions. I have and a I, I see some. I see some hands raised also. Yeah. So maybe, uh, why don't you, Senator Inouye, why don't you go first and then I'll go and see if some of the House members have questions. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you. Uh, and this comment, more comment on questions to either Emma or Robert, um, you know, with regards to the uh, rod, but there's another invasive um, tree that has been pretty prevalent over the years, and that's the fire tree up at Volcano. Mm -hmm. And um, it's rather interesting because, um, because what we had with the lava air, uh, the VOG, uh, it seems like it didn't kill the fire trees. No. Uh, interesting though, that, um, and why I concerned and know about the fire trees, because we have a home up at the Volcano Golf Course. Um, and we've been, um, we've been cutting back, we've cleaned our property, and so we don't have any of the fire trees, but our neighbors do. Um, but looking at um, recently when I went up there, and I haven't gone there for quite some time, and I was rather surprised um, that where the golf course is and the surrounding communities, which is in their backyards, it took over the ohia trees already. I, yeah. I'm, I, I couldn't even see some of the ohia uh, at all uh, where ohia dominated volcano. So I was wondering, and maybe Nicholas is, if he's still on from CETAR, if I remember years ago, there was research on the fire trees. And I thought at one time, I went to um, a release of, I, I'm, I think it was the moth years ago. Uh, I was wondering if um, we just abandoned that problem or if it's an issue at all, uh, Emma, uh, regarding fire trees other than the volcano community, if it's anywhere else. And I was just wondering if it also had something to do with, um, with the rod landscape. Um, but don't know, maybe it's not because I, I took a, I, I've seen the rod um, through the volcano area up until Ka'u uh, by helicopter, um, but I, I haven't seen the fire trees yet, but I don't know because, you know, it's, it's so uh, dense now up there. Em? And Emma, if, if yeah. you can. The, um, what, I want to ask Rob to talk about whether there's any biocontrol work done, but I do know that it is also a big problem on Kauai, and um, it's a really good example of the two-pronged problem with rapid ohia death because you have these trees dying and what comes up after it is these invasive species, primarily in the lower elevations. When you have a high elevation native forest that doesn't have these other invasive weeds, a lot of times natives come back. And so that's a more healthy system that is, um, and in many cases, ohia seedlings are coming back, but these other weeds are the big problem with um, rapid ohia death. Do you want to elaborate, Rob? Yeah. So, um, go ahead, Rob. Uh, there, what your 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 memory is uh, on spot there. Um, there was a release um, several decades ago um, yeah. to control by a tree, and I'm not quite sure the status of whether it did not establish in Hawaii or whether it just has marginal impact. Um, it is an example of uh, invasive species that's widespread that we're gonna need additional biological control to manage effectively in the future. Um, I don't know if anybody from Department of Ag remembers that release and what the, what the outcome of it was, but um, I believe it never established. Did One Emma the... say that it's on Kauai as well? Emma, was it Kauai? Yeah. It was noticed. Yeah, fire trees over there also. Okay. So One of the uh, senator, I don't know what uh, I don't know exactly what the college has been involved in in the past or currently, but I'll get back to you on uh, on what's what is current and what kind of information we have. 
from the past. So the biological control um, within CTAR and uh, DLNR, I mean, are we lost with um, uh, your biological control or management, Bob, uh, in, um, in DLNR? What I'm gonna do is check with uh, both uh, Forest Service uh, entomologists and, and see what we're going on. Going on there, we've worked with uh, Tectococcus ovatus for the strawberry guava, and have released in certain areas. So it's in process, but it took us 12 years uh, to finally get, you know, the approval to release that a few years ago. So that's in process. The other thing in process in regards to Ohia is that the Forest Service is uh, doing some uh, extensive research in trying to come up with discovering or uh, coming up with disease resistant ohia. So there, we're putting in a lot of uh, joint work together on that. And uh, that's one of the areas. So as uh, Senator Bernadette mentioned uh, earlier, you know, are we with the change with all these challenges, are we giving up our hands and throwing up our hands? No, quite the contrary. It's inspiring it's us to look at various ways. We're training, we have uh, Kilo, Dr. Kilo Hakini uh, with the Forest Service is training some dogs uh, that we brought in to sniff out rod. And so that's another progress we're doing for discovery and, and uh, checking stuff. But there are lots of things going on, more than we can uh, mm -hmm. tell you all about in this very short uh, meeting. And we look forward to a more extensive stuff. What I really want to wanna look forward yeah. to, Lorraine. Is that a chance for some house members to ask a few questions? Oh, yep. Sorry. Thanks. And and um, I have a few questions, but you know what? I'll follow up offline and defer to people who have questions now. And maybe we can try to keep questions and answers concise. So, um, you know, if anyone has a question, raise their hand. I guess I see Rep Peruso has her hand up. Thanks, I do have a question. Um, so my question has to do with um, what I see as a, um, an intensifying conflict over um, ranch lands or lands that are adjacent to existing ranch lands and um, uh, you know, who is gonna take responsibility or, or be in charge of these lands. And I know that um, there's been an ongoing conversation between the Department of Agriculture and DLNR, and I, I watched the last hearing, and I am hopeful that um, we can have a, a meaningful um, consensus develop. But given these concerns about um, rapid ohia death and the impact of hooved animals, um, I, for me, it just heightens uh, the urgency of protecting our existing forests. Um, and I'm wondering if someone from uh, Department of Agriculture could speak to the, your level of preparedness in protecting those forests if those lands do indeed all come under your purview. Uh, this is Phyllis Shimabukuro Geyser, Chairperson, Department of Ag. Thank you, Representative Peruso for that question. Uh, you know, um, the, tr the Act 90 transfer um, requires mutual agreement be between both boards, uh, Board of Land and Natural Resources and the Department of Agriculture. Um, the, the pastoral lands that are currently with uh, DLNR um, are under discussion between both our departments to see what we mutually agree upon for transfer. Um, that being said, um, we continue to work um, on um, the transfer issue. Um, you know, yes, uh, feral ungulates are uh, devastating to um, the forest and the watershed, um, but I believe that over the past decades, uh, the ranchers in Hawaii um, are very good stewards and they pride themselves on being 
good conservationists too. Um, so with that, you know, we continue to work together um, and meet and um, try to come to a mutual consensus on um, what we are transferring over through Act 90. I think what I would add to that, uh, Representative Peruso, is that when it comes to dealing with things like rod and transfer and all that, both ag and its quarantine person, people in particular, as well as the Fed agencies, uh, Department of Ag, Department uh, and uh, Forest Service, etc. We work, we pull together as one team. So we may differ on uh, some some issues, but when it comes to dealing with the enemy invasives, we are a single team, and we work together. Thank you, Bob. Rep. Martin, you had a question. I did. Um, earlier, um, Josh had mentioned that there was areas for uh, making progress with small um, statutory changes that don't cost money. And I just wanted to make sure that he had shared those needs with somebody who could introduce them. Thanks. Um, you know, not this year, I haven't reached out um, specifically, but I'm referring to items that are in the biosecurity plan. So we, every, um, every year we send updates on kind of what items have and have not um, been worked on. And so there's a list of policy ideas in there um, that could be worked on um, in any given year. Some of them are things that um, do need some progress to be made first. And so, um, for example, there are a number of policy changes around ballast water and biofouling that are recommended. But as the landscape changes with VITA, I think that's it's more of an ongoing dialogue with um, experts at aquatic resources than it is just looking at what's in the biosecurity plan. But we do try to communicate those on a regular basis back to the legislature. Thanks, Josh. Any other questions from the House? Looks like um, Rep. Bronco has his hand raised. And then Chair Hashem also. Hi, my question was uh, concerning our native birds, and I just wanted to see what was the status of the introduction of the, the Wabakia mosquito um, and seeing what we can do on behalf of our native bird species. Yeah, either Josh or M should take that. Josh, do you want to go? Um, sure. So the status is that um, there is a, a working group formed. It's now called um, Birds Not Mosquitoes. And they're basically looking at what are the, um, the technical and the regulatory needs to make that happen. So, um, you know, I can put you in touch with the folks that are coordinating that working group to get more specific updates. I don't have um, off the top of my head kind of the current regulatory status, um, but I know that they are in the process of working on uh, multiple lines of research around the bacteria and trying to get it into um, mosquitoes collected here in Hawaii. And um, there's also different researchers looking at uh, other tools as well, but they haven't yet identified like a, um, a site for doing a trial with the um, bacterial infused mosquitoes or yeah. infected mosquitoes. So and that's still a work in Bronco, as far uh, as recently as two weeks ago, Chair Case and I met with the new regional uh, director for uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. And, and we have been discussing how we can up the advancement on Wobokia uh, research and, and practice. Uh, useful, helping to save our endangered native Hawaiian birds. Uh, Phyllis Shimabuko Geyser, Department of Ag, like to add to that, that um, uh, Chair Case, myself, and um, key leadership did meet um, with Department of Health also last year. And uh, we're, we, we have been working together to assist uh, Department of land and natural resources and uh, uh, forestry and wildlife to um, address any permit requirements for importation of any um, needed um, sources uh, of biocontrol um, to address the problem of the endemic 
um, endangered birds. Okay, uh, what we'll do is just alternate between the Senate and the House. Any Senate members have any questions? Okay, any House members? Okay. I think, I think Rep. Hashem has his question. Yeah. Okay. So for DLNR, what are you guys doing about the Molokai access deer, the overpopulation? Uh, what is your plans going forward? Rob, you want to take that? Are you familiar? We have any wildlife guys on? I think Dave, David Smith might might take that one. Yeah, Dave's on the call. Oh, Dave's on the call. Okay, good. Dave would be the best. Dave? Yep. <clears throat> yeah, we got a multi-agency uh, task force over there working on that. We're working with the private landowners. We're co uh, coordinating with the county and DOT. Um, trying to assist them. Most of the problem is not actually on uh, state land or land uh, controlled by DLNR. It's mostly private land and roads, either county roads or, or uh, state highways. But we're working with the different agencies to try to bring the resources, um, uh, make sure we got the resources in the island. What we're doing is going out and collecting animals. So we're trying to relieve people of um, you know health issues like animals dying. Uh, on their property and whatnot. We're trying to collect those animals, take them out to private um, property, digging, we're digging trenches and burying them. So that's all in cooperation uh, with both the agencies and the private landowners. And, um, you know, it's not just a deer thing. It's uh, because my thing at first was like, well, let's throw some food out there. Let's open up some more water sources, but it's not that easy. Um, the situation is such that even cattle are dying. Um, so there's uh, a widespread issue uh, with with ungulates on the landscape and just not enough um, food or water resources. And um, so we're taking a close look at, you know, how we can try to relieve it immediately. But uh, we're talking about right now, maybe going out and doing some culling uh, to bring the animals down. There's a lot of animals that are basically um, staggering around out there, very weak, um, in a bad condition, um, most likely to die. So we're working on a multi- uh, agency effort to see if we can't get out there and, and do some culling just to bring those animal populations down to where uh, the current status of the um, landscape can um, sustain them. Uh, going forward, you know, again, a lot of this is a private land issue. We don't have any um, seasons or bag limits on deer. You can take them anytime you want uh, as long as you have a hunting license. And so there isn't much we can do more in terms of making hunting more uh, liberal, um, but we probably need to look at um, maybe bringing some more opportunities to private lands to uh, and and developing a um, a population um, <clears throat> um, you know estimate that we think you know a plan to try to keep them within a certain population so that they don't uh, the numbers don't skyrocket and um, get into a situation like we have now. A lot of it's exacerbated by drought over there and whatnot. And, and most of this is on the west side of the island, which is, as you know, very dry. Uh, Senator Ocasio had a question. Uh, yes, thank you for this presentation. It's very informative. I was wondering, um, is there anything active um, being done on the Hawaii Island um, with the imminent threat of um, the Queensland longhorn beetle um, attacking the fruit tree? So I can say briefly, uh, this is Josh Howard from DLNR, that um, through the Interagency Hawaii Invasive Species Council, uh, we're funding a research project that um, looks at trapping potential for the beetle, uh, because that's one of the, the initial gaps is that they can't work with the beetle until they have a good uh, method for trapping it. Um, but as far as um, control or uh, impacts to agriculture, I'd have to defer to the Department of Ag staff for that. Darcy Oishi, would you like to uh, respond? Sure, uh, Darcy Oishi, Hawaii Department of Agriculture. Um, along the, the lines for lure development and, and a trap, uh, recently the USDA through um, Plant Protection Act 7721 awarded some funding to um, the Otis Laboratory in Massachusetts, which we are partnering with to help develop a lure and other trapping me mechanisms. Um, 
as far as control the um, Queensland longhorn beetle and other large invasive um, boring beetles really represent difficulties with control. Um, there's no pesticide applications are always problematic, uh, primarily because what happens is when they bore into the wood, they're actually disrupting the movement of pesticides. So getting the kind of pesticides dosage needed to actually do control is very difficult. So the only real way to control something like the Queensland longhorn beetle is to destroy the infected plant. Um, and and, and, and until new techniques and technologies are developed, it, it's be basically the only real solution to addressing that issue. Chair Lowen, you have some questions? Chair Gabbard, may I suggest since we've gone so far over our intended timeline, might be efficient for each of us to ask our members if they have questions to send it to their respective chairs and then we can follow up with the uh, agency representatives so that we can uh, handle that because there's way more questions than we have time for as you can That's see. That's fine. Yeah. Good idea, David. Okay, but Chair Lowen, did you want to ask? Can I, can I squeeze in a last a couple yeah. questions? I guess you guys can tell me if you would rather answer them now or send a response, but two questions. I know Emma mentioned the um, Conservation Corps funding that came through the CARES Act funding. And I would just be interested to hear more specifically about how that, um, how many jobs that was for like DOFA or the ISCs and how that interacted with state agencies directly. If it was useful, if it would be more helpful, if it was longer term funding instead of just the three months. That was question number one. And question number two is about the Hawaii Ant Lab and whether that's in any risk of losing funding, if it's in a okay position, and especially for the office that we opened on the Kona side, which I know has been really busy and really helpful to the West Hawaii residents, is that, you know, what's the situation of that because of COVID? Yeah, thank you so much to you folks at the ledge who provided that um, CARES Act funding, and it was very helpful. I will follow up with you on the actual numbers and where they all went, but Definitely, the longer these folks are able to be employed, it's so much more efficient and helpful to us. So, you know, it takes a while to just train us up or train these, these um, jobs up and would be much better if we could get much longer term um, staff that can really know the land and know what we're doing. So, thank you. Uh, just really briefly. Yeah, Lauren, uh, may I just add that? Besides uh, longer term on that, on the CARES funding thing, one of the casualties that uh, we'd love to have you guys consider uh, on all of this cutback is our Youth Conservation Corps at DOFA. This was a very painful, painful situation. But uh, unless there is a way in which we can salvage, uh, that's one of our most significant young people's uh, opportunity. I hate to lose it, but that's one of the casualties of our cuts. And oh, Chair, yeah. just briefly for your question about the Ant Lab, um, they received funding in part from HISC and in part from Department of Ag directly. And I think um, talking to the manager, it sounds like both of those funding sources are likely to decrease this year. And um, so I think they are in a bit of a precarious position funding wise, um, I believe they have enough to make it through the year, the calendar year for personnel, but um, it doesn't really leave much for operation expenses. That's the last thing I heard from the manager. Um, and I also heard that they've had a difficult time trying to get the um, funds released for that Kona position just because of the way it's um, housed within the university structure. Uh, Representative uh, Lowen, uh, for the Department of Agriculture, um, we have been approached um, by Hawaii Ant Lab uh, for funding for two proposals. And um, we believe that with um, maybe uh, a minor um, decrease, we are able to fund those two proposals um, that are for statewide uh, core support. Um, and, um, we're, you know, we'll be able to do that with our uh, special funds. As long as we have our special funds, I think uh, we can, you know, address uh, invasive species issues um, and support that. 
in addition to um, uh, filling some of our positions that are vacant through special funds for um, meeting uh, some of our biosecurity plan goals. Is there, did the, is it Nicholas from CTAR? I'm not sure if he could answer that question, but I know the bill that we passed for the position in Kona, that was inadvertently, I think, uh, put through UH Hilo maybe instead of Manoa where the funding normally comes from for Hawaii Ant Lab. I don't know if it were the opposite. Josh is nodding like that sounds right, but apparently they're having some issue getting those funds released. And that is frustrating because that was very specifically, I mean, that bill was very specifically written to specify that that was for funding the West White position for the Hawaii Ant Lab. So um, not sure if anyone on this call has any influence on that or can explain that to me, but I'd be curious to know the answer. Looks like Dean Comerford's gone, so I'll, I'll make sure that he gets back to you. So we're, we're at an hour and a half. Thank you very much for everybody for participating, colleagues, and also from DLNR, Department of Ag, and CTAR. Thank you for all you guys do. So well, thank, uh, thank you very much, both you, you, all the chairs, the four chairs. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. Okay. Aloha, everyone. Okay. Aloha. 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 Aloha.